Good morning, everybody. It's the uh, second Sunday in Advent. Here it is, the 5th of December, 2021. And here we are in the sanctuary, and obviously right now you're looking at the Advent wreath. It's two candles lit today because it's the second Sunday of Advent. And obviously when we talk about Advent, most people, just about everybody thinks about the arrival of the Christ child, which is, I mean, that's par for the course. That's what everybody thinks about. We think about the, the baby being born. Remember last week when we talked about Advent was the coming of the Christ, coming of the Christ child. We talked about uh, the whole idea of Christ the King Sunday and the King is coming. I mentioned that because we do focus not only on the arrival of the child, the Savior, as came as a baby, we also look at the coming of the Savior who, <coughs> who will come at, the, um, come at the end of the age and he will come for us. So uh, the passage that we have today speaks about the amazing comfort that it is that we have this, um, the, the Christ child that comes. The passage that we have today um, talks about, uh, it comes from the book of Isaiah chapter 40. It's a really interesting thing. I'm going to give you a little bit about, uh, a little bit about the, the history of um, the Hebrew people and their writings, particularly the book of Isaiah. It's important to remember, and I'll say this word again, and you, you probably heard me say this many times because it's absolutely crucial. When we, when we choose to remember, it is to our benefit. When we fail to remember, that means we forget. And then when we forget, there are certain things that we wish we would have known. Remember last week I mentioned to you there was a man by the name of George, George Santayana. He's from... Uh, Spain. He made this comment. It's a pretty, uh, pretty profound. When I first heard it, I thought that's pretty interesting. He said, "Those who who forget history, that that fail to remember, that do not remember history, are destined to repeat it." What does that mean? How many of us, because we forget the things that have gone before, we end up repeating the same mistakes that that others have done in previous generations? We have been given the opportunity to remember these things. Why do we keep coming back every year and celebrating Christmas? Why do we, why do we go through that cycle? Well, there's a very simple reason. God in his sovereignty, he tells us, remember the things. Uh, when the uh, children of Israel came out of uh, Egypt, out of slavery, he set them a, a, a calendar. He wanted them to keep re repeating, remembering, remembering, remembering to the point where people say, well, I'm tired of remembering that stuff. But you know, that is where um, that, the idea of remembering is always helpful for everyone, always has been. That's why we learn things, because we remember. We remember the lessons of history. We remember the lessons of math and science. We remember the lessons uh, that are taught to us since we were little. I would venture, and I do this a lot, I would venture to say most of us remember the most important teachers in our lives. And we can think of something that, that, just, that was just so powerful. I can remember Mrs. Beck when I was in the fifth grade. Mrs. Beck was, um, she allowed me and one of my good friends to, uh, to do these experiments, these scientific experiments. And we had a science kit. I remember that vividly. I remember Mrs. Um, uh, Mrs. Cooper. Mrs. Cooper was this amazing musician. She could, she could make the, she could make the, we had this old upright piano. She made that thing dance. When the kids got together on, on Friday before school was out for the week, for the weekend, she would gather all the kids in the school. We had a three room, we had, we actually had two one room schools that were joined together. They were actually nailed together, fast together. Then we built a third room onto it. We had 60 kids in three rooms. And Mrs. Cooper, played music. Not only that, Mrs. Cooper shared th something with us that I've never forgotten. She shared the gospel. She talked about Jesus Christ. She talked about the coming Messiah. She told us history lessons from scripture. I'd never heard that. I mean, it, wasn't an, it was not an uncommon thing back in that day. Um, it was, in fact, it was the norm. All of us, I think every kid in that school went to church or Sunday school someplace. Many of us went the same, uh, the same places. Anyway, today the passage 
uh, it comes from um, Isaiah chapter 40. Now here's a little, uh, a little sketch I want to show you. Just a bit of review. How many books are there in the, in the Bible? You know? How many books in the Bible? Well, there's 66. How many are in the Old Testament? Well, there's 39. So that means there's 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New. Now, the New Testament, this is the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the, the books of the Old Testament tell the story about creation, sin, and all the difficult things. And there was no, there was, there was not the plan of salvation as it was outlined in the New Testament. So the 39 chapters of the Old Testament, excuse me, 39 books of the Old Testament tell a story about a difficult times. The New Testament talks about the coming of the Christ child, and because of Christ comes, there's a whole new um, idea of what unfolds in history. Now, I bring this up because, interestingly enough, the passage we have today comes from the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like the Old and New Testament. Uh, 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah, 66 books in the Bible. Just like Isaiah, excuse me, just like the Bible, the first 39 units in the Bible, that was the first 39 books, talked about the difficult times, the sin that people committed, and, the, and how they could not get out of that rut. The 27 books of the New Testament give us hope. Similarly, the book of Isaiah, the first 39 chapters, talk about the rut of sin that people are invested in and involved in. And the last 27 chapters of the book of Isaiah give us a powerful message of hope. These last 37 talk about, you guessed it, they really focus on the person, the ministry, the message, and the advent of the coming Christ. So this is really a good Advent passage. Now, the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah dealt with very difficult things. The, very, the next chapter would be chapter 40, which would be the beginning of the last 27 chapters. That's what I'm going to read right now. I'd like you to listen to what this says. It is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty amazing comment. Here we go. Remember, this talks about the coming of what we need to, what we need to do. If you take a look, there's the banner we have. You see, last week we had it said, uh, watch. The next one is prepare. Prepare for the coming of the Christ child. So having said that, now remember, I just mentioned to you, I just told you that the, um, this next chapter, chapter 40 of Isaiah, talks about this amazing hope that comes. Here are the first words of chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says, says your God. A voice of one calling in the desert place, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up and every mountain and hill will be laid low and the rough ground will become level. And the rugged ground becomes plain, flat. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all of mankind will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. I mention that because that word comfort, that's the very first two words. You see it's repeated twice. Um, there's something pretty amazing about that. You see, the word comfort, in the, that language it means, the, the word would be naham, naham doesn't mean much to us. But if you remember the books of the Bible, there's a prophet, his name is Nahum, same word. His name literally means comfort. Nahum's name means comfort. The word, if you were reading this text in Hebrew, he would say Naham, Naham, comfort, comfort. Comfort my people, says the Lord. I bring that up because there are certain things that bring amazing comfort to us. What are the things that you choose that you look forward to 
that bring you a sense of peace, calm, and comfort. My guess is that one of those things is uh, the advent of Christmas, the coming of Christmas. You look forward to it. There's the, the music. There's the music, the opportunity to go to church, the time with family, those sorts of things. Is that just a cyclical thing that we look forward to that on Christmas Eve? There will probably be quite a few people here. Uh, we appreciate that. And by God's grace, we sense that they appreciate it even more because that's a time when they go to seek comfort. It says a voice calling, uh, calling in the desert. Now we know that uh, that story takes, that talks about um, uh, John the Baptist. This next reading is from Psalm chapter 85. There's a, it's, I'm going to go through it, but I want you to listen to these. These are verbs. And every one of these first uh, four lines talks about um, a level of comfort that God has given to his people. I'm going to say these words, and I'd like you to think as I say these words. Remember, this is, Isaiah, excuse me, this is Psalm uh, 85, with beginning at verse 1, with 1 and 2. If you got your Bibles, go grab it right now and, and uh, turn to this page, turn to this and read along. It won't be long. Um, I'm not going to take too long with this. But I want you to see the, the verbs of the activities that God gives out to us. Psalm 85, beginning of verse 1. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. I will listen to what the Lord, what, what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near for those who fear him and his glory, that his glory may dwell in our land. I want to repeat those, those verbs to show favor. When was, in, can you think of those times when you were shown favor? Think of those times by a teacher, by a mentor, by a, by a family member, when they showed you favor. You may not have deserved it, but they showed it to you. And you're, you, you're, you, it says you restored the fortunes of Jacob. Have you, did you have ever, ever have something restored to us, a position where it was previously? And you were surprised, you were amazed, uh, something was returned to you, someone, something was fetched up from what you thought was lost and now it was given back to you. You forgave the iniquity of your people. Have you ever been forgiven? All of us have been forgiven. Are you, can you remember those times? I think it's crucial for us to remember the times that we were forgiven. If you want to hit the pause button, that's fine. But think about the times that you were forgiven. If somebody actually said, I forgive you. Have you ever asked for forgiveness? I've revisited this theme a number of times. How many people never ask for forgiveness because of the stubbornness in their lives? They're just stubborn people. I'm not going to do that. Why? Why not? If God can forgive us, why can't we forgive others? More importantly, can we forgive ourselves? If others can forgive us, why can't we forgive ourselves? We have all done very foolish things. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Well, I can't see anyway. Well, raise your hand if you want to at home and ask yourself, what did I do that was really foolish that was forgiven? Have I been, have I been forgiven of those things? I can remember cases with uh, teachers, uh, uh, individuals, family members, and people are ready to hand out forgiveness if there's a sense of brokenness on our part. And I know there are some people who say, well, I don't want to be broken. I'm, nobody's going to push me around. Folks, we're broken all the time. In fact, many people are broken every day. Some people are broken their whole lives. And there's no way what they can, there's no way they can seem to get out of that predicament. They need forgiveness. Oh, God offers that. I'm simply mentioning this. Can you offer the same? It says, you forgave the iniquities of our people and covered all of our sins. 
covered our sins. Now, that's a strange word that we have in our vocabulary, the word sin. I'm sure you've heard me say this before, but in one of the recent uh, uh, young people's dictionaries, the word sin is not, uh, is, not even in the, is not even in the dictionary. It's just taken out. Because sin is too, uh, it's considered to be too negative a word. We can't say the word sin because we don't want to step on somebody's toes. Uh, Jesus, God, um, our fellow Christians, people tell me when they've sinned. And it's important to recognize that. It's important to recognize it so that we can ask for forgiveness. This last passage, this is from the book of Mark, chapter 1. I'm going to give you a couple examples that did exemplify this. Um, it says, uh, this, is the beginning of the, this is the beginning of the gospel about Christ Jesus, the Son of God. It is written in, the, in, the, in Isaiah the prophet. Remember, this is the very first word, the first verse of Mark, chapter 1. And the second verse is, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The one, of, the one crying in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. We know that was John. Isn't that interesting? That the ministry of Jesus Christ began 700 years before? That's the way it's outlined. So I'm going to ask the question, when did your life begin? When did your existence here on earth begin? Was it the moment you were born? Was it nine months before you were born? Was your, was your personage seen by God himself before you were even born? The answer is yes. God knows what your role is. And he knows that you have been planned to be that agent of forgiveness. Here it says, I have sent my messenger ahead of you. That was, that was John the Baptist that came ahead of Jesus. But there's also these other messengers. Many of us are called to be to play that role of a messenger. Now you may know, you may think I'm, I'm I'm not playing that role. You actually do it all the time. You all you always do that because in your role as a servant of God, you are preparing other people to hear about what God has for them, as that has been done for you your entire life. So now that becomes an opportunity for you to do that with others. It says, John came in a region and was preaching baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him on the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and honey. And this was his message. This was John's message. Listen carefully. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Shocking message. Hang on to that word. Shocking message. So shocking that people would think that, how, how can you know that God's Holy Spirit will come down. John the Baptist gave that declaration. That was the prophecy. And it came true. I'm going to stop right there. Um, we're going to go on with more with John the Baptist next week. But I want to give you a couple of uh, those examples. Um, a couple of those examples that are shocking. And you would think, why did that happen? Number one, I heard this, uh, this example probably 40 years ago. It was in St. James Lutheran Church over in Lafayette, Indiana. I remember I was sitting with my cousins there on the, uh, the east side, or excuse me, the right side of the congregation. And I remember vividly when the pastor told the story, and it truly amazed me. I'll share it with you. There was a man, he was, uh, it was in... Um, I believe it was in one of the courts uh, east of, eastern part of Missouri, and he was given the task to take, um, there was a, a pardon of uh, the death sentence. There was a man condemned to be, uh, to be executed at the state prison. 
And this man knew that uh, he only had a certain time to get there, I think five days, and he had to ride hard to get there. But he had to, he stayed up late, he, he crossed very difficult, uh, crossed a river, I remember that was part of the story, went through some storms, hazardous, but he was running out of time and he needed to get there before the, the, the execution took place. He got there just before the last day. He came up there and he pounded on the door of the, uh, the penitentiary and he, and he begged them to, to let him in. Who is it? He said, I have a message from the governor. The governor. So they, they uh, allowed him to come in and they said, what is it? And he handed him this letter, he handed it to him and they read it and it said that the man that was to be executed, he was pardoned and his life was spared. So they passed it on. The governor, the governor took that. Obviously, uh, the governor had sent that, and the uh, warden at the prison honored that request and honored that document, and the man's life was spared. And they asked him, they said, when did you start? And, they, and the man told him. They said, you risked your life. And he said, yeah, I did. Did you know this man? No, I didn't know him. Then why in the world would you work so hard to get here on time. Why would you do that? And the man said, um, the reason I did it is because I too was once convicted of murder and I was given a stay of execution. So I was redeemed, I was saved. And I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to have the sentence of death hanging over me. I also know what it's like to be, to be free. I know what it's like to be redeemed, redeemed. And he said, I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I want this man to have that opportunity. I'll close there. I've got one other story. I'll, I'll save it for the next time. Blessings to you. That comfort that comes from the book of Isaiah is the comfort that's offered to you and I in the person of Jesus Christ. We have this beautiful scenery right now. It's, um, it's getting late. It's a beautiful day. But the true beauty of the season is not in the candles and not in, the, not in all the decorations we have. It's in the in knowing in our hearts the relationship. Just like that man who rode all the way for five days to get to... Uh, the state penitentiary, so that the stay of execution could be granted. Because you see, that stay of execution has been granted to you and I. Has it gotten here? It's gotten here. It's gotten to us, but has it gotten into here and here? And we begin to ex accept and, and, and sense what it means to be forgiven. How many people sense, I don't need to be forgiven? You know, as sinners, you, you and I, all of us, Everyone needs to be forgiven. And by God's grace, I pray that for over these next few weeks, you will be even more excited about the, the forgiveness that comes, not just with a Christ child, but with Christ the King at the second advent. Blessings to you. Take care. Bye now.